Today, we're going to be discussing wants. When you come from complex trauma, it's not easy to identify what your wants are. Uh, just the whole concept of wants could, could cause trauma for you or cause uh, anxiety, just talking about your wants. Uh, but it really is so essential. You see, in the healing process to complex trauma, you need to get down to what PTSD really is or CPTSD. It is a combination of maladaptive beliefs and behaviors. So really all mental illness is a combination of maladaptive beliefs and behaviors. Put simply, that means that you have beliefs that are bad for you. You have beliefs that are bad. The thinking is not helping. It is not high quality thinking. So what's great about this is it can be changed. It can be approved upon. If you're feeling right now, if you're noticing right now that you're your thinking is not high quality thinking, it's not helpful thinking, you can change it. You can learn how to think in a high quality way. You can learn how to get out of trauma mind and get into your higher self, your higher way of thinking. So you can start reaching your potential. But when it comes down to, to wants, here, here's, here's the connection, right? Because in order to heal the maladaptive beliefs, in order to learn to get beliefs that are actually good for you, you have to change your beliefs. So an example of maladaptive beliefs that are common in uh, a complex trauma survivor is something like other people's opinions and feelings are more important than my own. This is an example of maladaptive thinking. It will lead you into all kinds of trouble and struggle. The idea that other people's opinions are more important than your own opinions. Now, you may have developed that because you grew up in a household with inadequate parenting. And so instead of your parents supporting you emotionally and building up your faith in yourself and building up your trust in yourself and making you feel that it was okay for you to occasionally disagree and to have your own mind and your own thinking, your own feelings, you may have had parents that said, no, you cannot disagree with us in one way or another. So if you ever disagreed with your mother, for instance, she became very critical, very mean, very, very demanding, uh, very abusive. She may have began to neglect you or ignore you if you ever disagreed or, or expressed an opinion that was different. And so you got the message very young, oh, I cannot have my own opinion. I cannot disagree with my parents. And so you don't develop faith in your own choices. You learn to prioritize other people's wants in an emotionally neglectful household above your own wants so that you have a way of surviving that environment because as a child, you needed love, attention, approval, validation, and you were not receiving it. If you don't receive validation and you don't feel valid as a child, and if you don't feel valid, then you don't feel your needs and wants are valid. And if your needs and wants are va aren't valid to everyone else, as a child, you may have come to the maladaptation that your needs and wants aren't valid at all. And so you abandon yourself and you let go of your own needs and wants and your own concern for what you want. And you prioritize what everyone else wants because that's the only way that you can keep everyone else happy. And you're thinking this will keep me happy because at least I won't be abused and at least I won't be hated in this household and at least I'll get some type of love and some type of approval. But you find yourself sad when you're alone. When you get a moment to reflect, it's just painful. And so you have to run away from your own feelings. This is maladaptive thinking. The idea that other people's comforts and preferences and feelings are above yours. So if that's maladaptive, i.e. wrong thinking, what is the correct thinking on other people's needs and wants? And well, it's to elevate your wants and needs to, to be equal to everyone else's. You are equal in worth and value. And so therefore your feelings are equal to everyone else's. That's adaptive thinking. What I want, how I feel, my comfort is as important as his comfort. That's adaptive thinking. And it will help you. It'll help you to speak up for yourself. It'll help you to assert yourself, assert your preferences, inform people of what you want instead of walking around with a mask, expecting that people can just read your mind and hoping that people don't walk all over you, which they most 
certainly will. Even though everyone's needs and feelings are equal, your primary responsibility is to whom's feelings? Your primary responsibility is to your own feelings, isn't it? Your primary responsibility is to advocate for your own needs, to advocate for your own wants, to advocate for your own preferences and desires. It is your responsibility. To that end, many trauma survivors have failed themselves because they have not spoken up for what they want. They have not spoken up for how they felt, for what they needed. They might even find it hard to know what that is. They feel like they don't know what they want because they've spent so much time in their developmental process just trying to survive and they've abandoned the thought process of learning to know thyself just to become hypervigilant and learning to understand everyone else. And so you ask them, what do you want? And they blank out. They don't know. Whatever you want, a survivor might say. But adaptive thinking is your, all, your feelings and your comfort is as important as another person's, and it's your responsibility to advocate for yours. When people give the sentiment, hey, you have to put yourself first, they don't get it exactly right. It's not that you have to put yourself first. Everyone is equal, but it's as I just gave it to you. It's more complex. It's not going to be simple. And it's not going to be easy. It's more complex than just put yourself first. It's not the answer for everything. Sometimes you have to sacrifice yourself a little bit. But the answer is understanding that you are just as important as everyone else. But your primary responsibility in this universe is to your feelings, comfort, needs, and to advocate for that. So why is it that, that trauma survivors feel like they don't know what they want when their primary responsibility is what they want? Well, as we talked about, there's the past that has informed them to think that way and to act that way, which is all a maladaptation. But if you don't know what you want, it's really because you're too focused on what other people want. If we break it down and we make it simple. You're confused about your wants because you're too focused on what other people want, what other people desire, what other people are saying you should do. So you might get focused on, oh, well, society says that we need to be doing such and such and so and so. Or you may be too focused on my mom wants me to do this. My dad wants me to do this. My husband wants me to do this. My kids, my kids want me to do this. You're so focused on everyone else's needs, wants, preferences, desires that it drowns out the voice of your own needs, wants, preferences, and desires. You need, to, you need to silence the outside voices and turn up the volume on your own voice so that you can consider everyone in equal measure, including yourself. Not knowing what you want, this, this existential crisis of saying, I don't know what I want. It's because you are not listening to yourself. You are an abandoner of yourself. You are a neglector of the self. And you're focused too much on what everyone else wants. This is important because in the healing process, you have to know your objective. Otherwise, you don't know what decisions to make day to day, moment to moment. Because, of course, if you don't know where you're going, how can you know how to steer the car? How would you know whether to take a right or a left if you don't know whether you're going to Walmart on the north side of town or the Target on the south? You have to understand your objective, and the objective will inform the decisions. That's how you make decisions. That's how you have adaptive thinking and make adaptive decisions to your life. Your decisions will be maladaptive if you don't, if you're on the maladaptive belief that everyone else's feelings are more important than yours, then you're doing everything and making your decisions confused based on what's going to please everyone else. For example, if, if, if you have to make a decision on what sort of exercise you want to do, okay, should I be lifting weights? Should I be running or should I do no exercise at all? It depends. What does it depend on? It depends on your objective. If your objective is to play a superhero in a movie, then you will need to lift weights so that you can bulk up. If it is your objective to increase your speed or endurance, then you will need to go running. If it is your objective to gain weight, for a role that you're playing in a comedy, then you will need to stop running and not exercise at all.
there, there, there's no right and wrong answers for, for most situations in life. It's about making the best decision, the most adaptive decision towards your objective. When you have firmly in mind your objective, then you can make good decisions. What is your objective? Your objective is a goal. What is a goal? A goal is a destination. What is a destination? How do you choose that? It's based on what you want. You have to know what you want. So what if you don't know what you want? Have you ever seen The Notebook? It's like one of the best scenes in cinematic history where Ryan Gosling is yelling at Rachel McAdams and he's like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? You ever see that scene? It's perfect. Rachel McAdams in that, in that scene, right in that moment, she's confused. She doesn't have an answer for him. She doesn't know what she wants. She's just, I don't know. I got to go. And she gets in the car and just drives off, leaves them in the dust. Classic trauma survival mentality. I don't know what I want. I can't stand up for what I want. And so I'm actually going to sacrifice one of the most valuable relationships in my life because I've never trained myself to speak up for what I want. What was in her mind? It was all the pressure she had from her family and from her culture. She was concerned about what her father wanted and what, and what the consequences were going to be if she displeased him. And so if we live our life simply trying to avoid the consequences then again, we have a maladaptive way of living our lives. It seems right. Like, yeah, you got to live your life and avoid the consequences. But if your life is just simply based on trying to avoid displeasing people because of what's going to happen, what are the consequences are going to be? You're not ready for all of the nuances that are going to come in the real world. Because you're going to have to make decisions that are for the self, that are for your preferences, that will displease some. Some who are in positions of authority and who can make your, your existence painful, who can, who can uh, put, bring down consequences on your head for making a decision that displeased them, but you will still sometimes need to displease those persons because the people in authority aren't always right. And if you've never developed the muscle to understand that you have to think for yourself and make your decisions not based on what's going to please whoever's in charge then you will be like a boat with no motor and no sails, just floating. If you don't know what you want, if you won't identify what you want, if you can't identify your desires, then you're going to end up living your life according to someone else's desires. Because people in a position of authority try to squash out the independent thinking of those who are their subordinates. Often people in a position of authority don't want you to focus on your personal power, your ability to think as an individual, to make choices. And maybe your parents were that way. And so they trained you by weaponizing your internal fear against yourself. And they always wanted you to feel fear and guilt. So if you did anything that they didn't like, they would try to make you feel guilty for it. And they would say, God's mad at you for what you did. And if there's anything that, that you tried to do going against them, they would try to make you feel fearful by using physical punishments and discipline or threats. That's not unlike a lot of authorities in the government, in the workplace, right? They try to use fear to control people. But you must be locked into your personal power. You cannot simply live your life just trying to avoid consequences because sometimes people in positions of authority don't always have it figured out. They don't always have it right. So it's more adaptive to recognize that you'll need to make personal decisions for yourself. All of your decisions are yours to make. And sometimes it might go against what's popular, 
or what's being insisted upon by the people in your life, even by those in a position of authority, sometimes you will have to make a personal decision. That's adaptive thinking. Sometimes you will have to face the consequences or you'll have to deal with the guilt because you had to do what you believed was right so that you could sleep at night. Yes, you are an autonomous creature. You are not meant to be controlled by other humans. They are not above you in their worth and their value. Don't place more importance on their thinking and their opinion than your own. Now, you can certainly take their thinking and opinion into consideration. But you cannot base your entire existence on just doing what's going to please someone else. So, for instance, you're 18 years old and your parents tell you you have to go to college. Do you have to go to college? What you have to do is make a personal decision as to whether you will honor their wishes or not. How do you make decisions? Well, you have to weigh out the pros and cons. So take a piece of paper, put your, 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 the title of the decision at the top, should I go to college? And on one hand, put choice number one, yes. On the other hand, put choice number two, no. And then under yeses, put the pros, put the cons for each decision so that you can weigh it out. Assign a points value to, to how important each of these, these points are. So you might write a point like, this will cost me a lot of money. This will cost me a lot of time. But for it, you might write, it will please my parents. And you assign point values to each of the things on the list. And then you weigh out when you add up the point values, boy, there's more points going against this choice than there are going for the choice. Stop telling yourself you don't have a choice. It's time for grown up thinking. When you're a child, you're given things as if there is no choice. Don't touch the stove. That is what the instructions that are given to a child. As you grow up, you cannot live according to those instructions anymore. You will starve. You need to learn new instructions. You have to learn new adult level thinking. It's not that I cannot touch the stove. It is that the stove is dangerous. So I have to be careful how I use the stove. I cannot leave the gas on. I cannot touch it, touch the burner when the burner is on. I cannot touch the flame. You learn, but I can use the stove. I can touch the stove. It just depends how I use it. It is dangerous. You get the general principle instead of the basic rule. Get out of living by basic rules, elevate your thinking into understanding the general principle behind the rule. My parents told me not to touch the stove because the stove is dangerous. Now that I'm an adult, I need to recognize, yes, the stove is dangerous, but I still need to learn how to cook. And that's how we elevate ourselves out of maladaptive thinking, childish thinking, into adult level thinking, into adaptive thinking. When you replace maladaptive beliefs with all adaptive beliefs, you will cure your PTSD. It is also the cure to many mental illnesses because there is no mental illness without maladaptive beliefs and behaviors. If your thinking is high quality and your behavior is high quality, then you, you've cured your mental illness. I'm telling you this to give you hope. It is possible. Many of my friends are former clients. And they've been able to get themselves, they've been able to climb out of the maladaptive thinking and beliefs, which lead to the maladaptive behaviors. And now that they're, they're living according to a higher way of thinking, they're happy, they're at peace. And they know what they want. So what's stopping you from understanding what you want? Well, as we mentioned, the first step to, to knowing what you want is to stop worrying about what everyone else wants. Your mind has two parts to it. Understanding that there's two parts to it will help you to understand why there's confusion. Your, your emotional mind, the subconscious mind, is fear-based. And if you feel like there's a lot of fear in your life, um, it's probably because you've learned to live according to that emotional mind. Trauma will do that. But you cannot live according to your emotional mind. You cannot live according to the fear. You must live in your logical mind, your higher mind, your higher thinking. The cerebral cortex helps you to be analytical and critical in your thinking. It is strategic. You must be a strategic leader of the self. You have to show up to yourself 
like you're showing up to the boardroom. Don't panic when it is time to make a decision. Show up like a boss, like a leader. Okay, what's the problem here? Just like a leader, show up just like that. When you're feeling the anxiety, when you're feeling the turmoil, the sadness, the heartbreak, the psychological pain, you just show up like a boss to say, okay, everybody have a seat. What's the problem here? What do we need to discuss? Oh, well, uh, we don't know if we should pay this bill because if we don't pay this bill, then we lose our house. And if we don't pay this bill and we lose our electricity, we're not sure what to do. Okay, let's look at the resources that we have available. Bam, you're, you're in your logical, strategic leadership mind. How much resources do we have available? Oh, we got this much money. How much does this one cost? That costs this. How much does this one cost? Bam, what are the due dates of that? What's the absolute? Can we call them? Are they flexible? Who's more flexible? Who can we call and talk to? Okay, we can call and talk to them. Good. And can we do a partial payment on that? Bam. And then when we get paid again, bam. Okay, let's 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 set the let's set the strategy. What we're going to do today? We're going to make a call here. We're going to negotiate this payment. We're going to pay a little bit here, a little bit there. And then on this day, we'll be able to finish paying that off. Okay. Everybody agree to the plan? Good. Is there any other concerns? No. All right. Let's get to work. That's you talking to yourself. And the moment you do that, it took about five, 10 minutes, your anxiety, whew, oh, it feels so much better. I know what I need to do. That is how you must live. Not according to your fear, freaking out. Oh, I don't, okay, um, um, just turn on the music. I, I just can't think about this right now. I can't think about this right now. Running, running, running from the pain. Your anxiety system is not the leader of the self. It's not the punisher of the self. It does not belong to your parents. It does not belong to the government. Your anxiety system inside you is your personal assistant. It works for you. Don't ignore it. Have meetings with it. When you get a pain of anxiety, it is a signal that you have to sit down and have a meeting with your subconscious mind, have a discussion. There needs to be an adult discussion to take place, clearly, because there, there's something, there's something that's bothering you. That's what psychological pain is for. It is for protection to the self. Don't run from psychological pain. Don't distract yourself from it. Walk towards it and ask it to sit down at the boardroom table, have a meeting and show up as the conscious person that you are. You are a powerful being. Desire, wants are determined by choice. When you say to me, but I don't know what I want. You're bringing me into an existential discussion in which we have to go deep into what a human really is, because at the very base of humanity is desire. Desire is what drives humanity. Without desire, what will we have? What will we do? Nothing. We will do nothing without desire. Desire is fundamental. So what is desire determined by? How do you determine what you desire? How do you find what you want if you don't know what you want? It's by choice. Choice is a gift that was given to you in the form of free will. Yes, you were born with free will. That is synonymous with your consciousness. You are a conscious being. What your consciousness is, is a gift of freedom, moral freedom, the ability to make a determination, a decision for yourself. That is what it means to be a conscious being. When you say, I, I don't know what I want, and I don't know how to find what I want, you're basically saying, I don't know how to be a conscious being. Don't accept that. Don't ever say that. You may feel that way because you've been controlled for so much time in your life that you think you don't have the freedom and the choice and the power to make decisions, but that is not accurate. You have the power, step into your personal power as a conscious being and realize it's all my choice. What I want is a choice. It is a decision. This one or that one, my ability to choose is what makes me free. That's what makes me a free, conscious, living being. Step into that power. Don't, don't abdicate that. You need that. That's what makes you alive. When you feel obligated, when you feel controlled, you may tell yourself, I don't have a choice because I have to do this because I'm obligated to do this. Did you know it's still your choice? Because you can go against even what you're obligated to do. It's still your choice. When you acquiesce to the pressure, you're still making a choice. 
You are a living, breathing, conscious being who is powerful, who can make things happen. Step into your personal power. You make a decision by looking at the options that are available and choosing. So deciding what you want, what your purpose is going to be, what your goals are going to be, what your objective is going to be, is just making a choice. You're going to look at all the options available and you're going to say, based on the options available, based on what I know my abilities are and my interests, I think I would like to choose option A. I think I would like to become a musician or I think I would like to be an accountant. You make the choice. It is up to you. Once you've developed your decision of what your objective is going to be, now it informs all subsequent decisions because your, your, your choice, A or B, is either going to lead you closer to your goal or it's going to pull you away and then you know what to do. But you have to know what your goal is. You have to know what your objective is. And you got to drown out all these other voices. At best, they are suggestions that you can take. Also, your subconscious mind, your feelings, your emotions are only suggestions for you to take. You are in charge. You, the conscious being, are the king or the queen of your choices. You get to make a choice on what you will do. You get to choose even what your wants will be. You get to choose what your desires will be. Because not all desires are good desires, right? Some desires are actually unhealthy desires, right? But you get to choose what your desires will be. And you can cultivate desires, meaning you can grow them like a, like a plant in a garden. You can feed and water a desire. So right now, if I don't have the desire to go to the gym every day, I can cultivate that desire, can't I? By, by making sure I'm watching and listening to and reading things that have to do with exercise and building myself, right? And, and by taking myself to the gym and doing it more often, I can cultivate, I can grow that desire. The same way you can grow an unhealthy desire, right? A handsome man moves in next door, but you're already married. Do you automatically desire that man? Not necessarily. But if you keep looking at him every time he goes out to take out his garbage, every time he's on his way to work and he's coming home and you're peering out the window at the handsome man, you keep trying to interact with them. You can cultivate the unhealthy desire. And then if given the opportunity, end up doing something you regret. It is up to you. It is your responsibility, which is a kind way of saying it is your fault. If you cultivate unhealthy desires, that is your fault. Don't do that. Cultivate healthy desires. Choose what you want. What you want is a choice. Your wants are choices. You are in a position of power. So please utilize the, the resources available. You have the JAP method of writing, writing down what you want and being able to determine what is going to be the best choice for you. But by learning how to hear your own voice, elevating your own wants is equal to everyone else, advocating for your wants as your primary responsibility, you are stepping into who you are. You are developing a strong sense of self, and with a strong sense of self, you're no longer just this trauma survivor who keeps getting traumatized again and again. You will become invincible to your future traumas because there will always be things that will happen. But the inner self, the metaphysical self, does not have to become phased by them. The metaphysical self is resilient and strong if you build it into that. 